They're absolutely everywhere. We've got this growing evidence that the microplastic is a problem, that not very much has been done to look at solutions, at the what do we do about it. We need to start to take action. A beautiful view of the sea outside the coast of southwest England. Looking at the sea from here, it's hard to understand that there is a massive problem of ocean plastic pollution out there. But it's right here in England where scientists first discovered what happens to all our plastic waste when it breaks down into microplastics. So microplastics are a huge array of contaminants. Wherever we go, we can find them. Now this is quite large plastic, as you can see, but when it's in the marine environment, the action of the wind and the waves and the UV light breaks it down into smaller and smaller pieces. It doesn't degrade, it doesn't go away, it becomes microplastics. These small fragments are actually the most numerous. When I started to teach students, I set them the challenge. I said, go and find me the smallest piece of plastic on the beach. And that's really what started the story of the microplastics. We found plastic smaller than the grains of sand themselves. The size range that they break down into is exactly the same size range as the prey items for so many different marine animals. So there's the potential for them to be ingested instead of nutritious food items. The three UK scientists, Richard Thompson, Tamara Galloway and Penelope Lindeku, have been at the global forefront of marine litter research for many years. They have also helped to bring about changes in global policy with their work central to international government legislation and influencing the process, leading to the United Nations Treaty on Plastic Pollution, signed by 175 nations. I think everybody is actually on the same page, that there is a problem and that, uh, that consensus, I would say, has led us to the, to the UN Treaty, which is fantastic. The UN Treaty on Plastic Pollution, due to be negotiated in the next couple of years, is the result of rising worldwide attention on the dangers of plastics. Oh, look at that. Absolutely no doubt that this bird died Stuffed as a result of that plastic. It's quite alarming, isn't it? Oh, it's awful. Even in one of the world's most protected natural environments, the pristine Galapagos Islands, scientists find vast amounts of microplastics. Galapagos is one of our most protected parts of the planet for the marine environment. That protection is what gives us this great biodiversity, but this protection doesn't stop microplastics from entering these waters. So we've been doing research in the Galapagos archipelago for the last three years, and we found quite high numbers of microplastics around those beautiful islands. These are our samples from the Galapagos. So bring it back here to the lab where we sort the plastics, as you can see here. And we use these for some of our lab experiments. We've collected samples from the deep sea, working with deep sea biologists. And since then we've gone on and we've sampled samples of snow taken from Everest. And we're finding microplastic there that's reached it by the air. So we realise now it is literally everywhere. Do we humans have it in our bodies too? It has been shown to be in our bodies, yes. Even to the fact of it's been in the placenta of pregnant women. Richard Thompson led the first study, published in 2004, describing marine microplastics. It was an alarm bell that got a lot of attention, and the topic has since become a focus for research worldwide. We were able to look back in time, it's a kind of time capsule, and we showed actually comparing across the decades over 40 years a significant increase in the abundance of this material. So then the next steps were almost to go on and look at the, the so what question, if you like. How harmful can it be? There are still significant gaps in knowledge about how microplastics spread and where they go. But intensive research continues. What we're doing is we're sampling from microplastics, those really small bits of plastic, less than five millimetres in size. We want to know how much is in the marine environment. We're also sampling for zooplankton, and we know from lab-based experiments that nearly every zooplankton species we've looked at in the northeast Atlantic can ingest microplastics. And we now know that that also happens in the natural environment. So yes, if those tiny, tiny bits of plastic are there, then the zooplankton can eat them. 
Almost certainly, all of us have plastics additives in our bodies. We know that from many of the studies that have been going on. So many of those chemicals can have harmful effects on the body. The scientists have also tracked the sources, from plastic bags to microbeads in cosmetics and tyre particles. It's clear that tyres wear on the road and they generate particles. What wasn't clear was where do they go? It's become dust that is entering the environment, entering watercourses, entering the oceans. Critically, the laureates have also looked into potential solutions, evaluating the potential for natural and mechanical measures to clear plastic from the environment. One of the things we're doing is turning towards a nature-based solution, and we're scoping the feasibility of using mussels, which are natural filter feeders, and they can ingest the plastic as they ingest their normal food, and they pass that plastic through them into their faeces. And from our lab-based experiments, we know that five kilograms of mussels can remove a quarter of a million plastics per hour. It's absolutely incredible. So we do a lot of testing to make sure that our interventions and our alternatives are fit for purpose. But then there are other sources of, of fragmentation from wear that all of the textiles, the clothing we're wearing, will progressively wear out whilst we're walking around in it and using it, but especially also while we're washing it. We've been studying the quantities released from garments as you wash them and how that varies according to the style of the garment. I try to find how we can design and produce better textiles to reduce the amount of microfibers they release to the environment. The microbeads in cosmetics, for example, very small particles used in cosmetics as an abrasive agent. All of these came out of this one container. In fact, some of the containers we looked at contain nearly three million small pieces of plastic. There's a huge effort going on in research and innovation all around the world on what we do instead and how we can produce safer alternatives. And the problem is it's a design problem. We're designing plastics to be robust and to survive for 500 years and then we're using them for 20 minutes and we're throwing them away. I mean, it's not a surprise that we've got a problem. The three scientists continue to work with industry and policymakers on the most effective ways to change the design of plastic products and to bring about a cultural shift in society's use of them. You are perhaps the, the godfather of uh, microplastics. Um, how far has our knowledge developed? The plastic in the oceans is going to be cumulative. It's not going to biodegrade. It is worth tackling. It's not so trivial that we should be looking elsewhere. You know, but certainly we realise there's a need to gather more evidence on harm, and that's what we're trying to do. We've educated the public, and that's helped put pressure on governments and companies. What about the process that gives them no alternative to use a plastic that will degrade harmlessly? It has to change so that we can get the benefits that are inherent in plastics without this rapid, continuous accumulation of highly persistent waste. Today, advanced research is almost always about collaborations. The three award winners have succeeded in developing methods and results within a research area that hardly existed 20 years ago. In many ways, you could say we're quite similar. We've got passion, we've got drive, we've got curiosity, but in other ways, we can be quite different. Penelope Lindigu, born and raised in South Devon, describes herself as having always been curious. Her fascination with biology led her to a scientific career in marine organisms and ecosystems, particularly zooplankton. I've always been intrigued about understanding how things work, especially in nature. When she first came to Plymouth Marine Laboratory, she was a PhD student looking at zooplankton. And I knew right from the very start that this was someone who was really committed to the science, but also to the environmental cause that underpins that science as well. I became interested in knowing what we as humans did to that natural environment. What impact did we have, in particular, on anthropogenic pollutants? She is a fantastic supervisor, making sure that we have a good work-life balance, so she tries to get the very best out of her team. Yay! Yay! Penny is very good at all sports. She likes being outside, she just loves being on a paddleboard, she loves being outside in the ocean. 
there's a sense of really moving back to nature and farming and being self-sufficient that's really, really close to our heart. I want to make a difference to ensure that our oceans remain clean and productive and healthy for our children and our children's children. When studying to become a marine biologist, Richard Thompson had no idea that he would once be called the godfather of microplastics. But as an academic, he coined the term microplastics, now commonly used in scientific and policy circles. Richard was fundamental to adjusting our survey methodology uh, in about 1990 to look at very small particles of plastics which were going to very soon degrade into microplastics because his research initially understood that it was likely at that point in time to go into the food chain. So he was fundamental to how we worked. As a scientist, he's focused on a problem, and until he's solved the problem, he won't give up. He's also extremely good at working in collaboration, and he's particularly interested in how do you deal with the outcome, not just what is the outcome, and I think that's the important thing. People's minds work differently, and the way he thinks and the way he processes stuff and comes up with ideas and projects is just really inspiring and really amazing. When we went to the Galapagos Islands, I have a very firm memory of Richard lying flat on a beach with a camera waiting for several hours for a Galapagos flamingo to do something for his camera image. He's a very keen wildlife biologist and very patient. I couldn't have done that. Tamara Galloway grew up in Scotland and studied biochemistry at the universities in Glasgow and Edinburgh. That she now, as a professor in ecotoxicology, has been awarded the Volvo Environment Prize comes as no surprise to the provost at the University of Exeter. I was absolutely thrilled. Tamara is one of our best scientists and the team, Team Plastic, is just a great example of what we can do. She's a great researcher and mentor and really supportive supervisor. I've always really enjoyed working with Tamara because of the fantastic ideas that she has. She always knows the important questions to be asking and she's driven some really big changes in the whole field of microplastics research. I think we're able to bounce ideas off each other and challenge each other's thoughts, which is really useful. It's really nice to work with people where we take slightly different perspectives on things. So we've been able to bring Richard's knowledge of marine biology, my knowledge of ecotoxicology and chemicals, Penny's knowledge of ecology. And we couldn't have done what we've done if it was just one of us. A scientist is sometimes criticised for working in an ivory tower. We need to lose that approach. The future is about academics working together to solve environmental challenges.